Hi, this is Roman. And this is Tyler. We're the directors of... Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street. And you're, you're listening, listening to, to Elm Street, Street Radio. Radio. Oh. <laughs> goodness guess who's back y'all it's elm street radio i'm deandra and this is Paige. and uh it's good to be back it has been a while i don't even remember the last time we had an episode it's been a while um we've both just been crazy crazy busy with side projects and continuing fred heads and just in our careers and it it has it's been a, a long time since we've gotten together but i am extremely excited for today's episode like so I've been waiting for this episode for a really long time so I'm excited what we're going to talk about today so what's been going on in your life how have things been going oh they've been good um yeah pretty much the same as you just career uh trying to prioritize a lot of the extra things going on in my life and of course things we've been doing for Fred Heads so that has been fun and uh, yeah, I'm excited to be back. In fact, tonight's the night where two documentaries meet. I'm like so excited for our, our guests that we're having on today. These two gentlemen that we're about to talk to, I feel like have inspired you and I so much over the past couple of years with their project and what they're doing. And really um, just the amount of like passion and dedication that they've put in over this project because we love the film. We love the subject that they are talking about. And it just, they've been such a great inspiration to us. And they've been very helpful to us with our documentary over the past couple of years. And so I'm just super excited to, to talk to them. I am as well. So without further ado, please join us in welcoming Roman Kimienti and Tyler Jensen of Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street. Welcome, guys. Yay. Hi! Yay. Yay! Thank you. This is awesome. We've been talking about this forever, and I'm so happy we're finally doing it. I know. I am, too. Um, so, you guys have been really busy taking the documentary around. What has that been like? A whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> it really, it really honestly has been. It's been, because it, it gets to a point where it's out of your hands and it's you just go with it and it's been unreal but it's also really new so we're still getting our our feet wet with not just the traveling but the presenting which is a whole new thing but it's been amazing right i mean most of the job of being a filmmaker is behind the scenes and getting things done and then suddenly now we've been thrust onto the spotlight as well speaking with Mark and it's a different uh, set of uh, skills that you have to learn (laughs) very quickly. So let's start from the beginning because I remember um, meeting you guys. We met you in 2015 at Horror Hound and one of you was holding a camera and one of you was holding a boom mic and we were dressed in costume and I just remember you guys were so much fun and seeing you guys document everything and really um document things with Mark and, and, and his journey there with like the nightmare two reunion, the whole huge nightmare reunion that they had, uh, was, was pretty cool. And, and I remember the, the project had been announced, uh, had been announced before that, but really being at that convention was when we got to see you guys like in action and it was, it was super cool. But how did you guys get involved with the documentary? Where did the idea come from? Um, and really, how did you guys, you know, meet Mark and, and start from the beginning? Tell, tell us how this project happened. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> so this is Roman. Um, I think, so it started with me, uh, just, it's a, a long story short, like a lot of people, I just realized one day what happened to Mark Patton and that was, 
it kind of surprised me because you know that th- this was the first movie that made me love horror movies. I watched it probably a year after it was released. I had a slumber party. We all watched this. It scared the shit out of me. It was the first one that like real scary true horror movie that I braved all the way through. You know, I think I was ten or eleven. And so and I just loved it. It didn't dawn on me like, oh, this is a guy that's in peril instead of a girl. I didn't know there was any of that. I just enjoyed it, you know, and I, I related to it because it was probably because it was a boy. Uh, but, it, you know, that wasn't really uh, that wasn't in my mind. So the fact that I loved it for all those years and never wondered what happened to Mark Patton really surprised me. Uh, so it hit me in the middle of the night and I looked him up and there he was as like being reintroduced to the world, stating his health, his newfound like uh, convention success and that he was also considering telling his story. And I thought, oh, wow, I didn't even know this whole the premise. I didn't know any of it. And when I was reading snippets of it, I thought this is fascinating skip to the end I just wrote to him and I said hey I'd love to help you with your story and then it all began so That's definitely like I met Roman randomly on a freelance job we were both working on this gay dating reality show I was editing he was doing sound for it and at one point he was telling the producer of that about this about what Scream Queen was about to start shooting and without really interjecting myself into that conversation I lifted up my t-shirt to show him my Freddy phone tattoo as like a solidarity of like, I'm a nerd too, and I need to be a part of this. So (laughs) I'm just like, absolutely. I I, I don't know anything other than what you just said in the sentence that it's about Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and Mark Patton. And I'm like such a huge Freddy nerd that I didn't care. I was like, I'm going to be a part of this and you can't get rid of me. So (laughs) let me help you. Yeah. That's awesome. I just called him like a couple hours later. I'm like, you want to do this movie or what? And it was, it was on. So, you know, we had a lot to figure out because a lot of, I think the thing that's the most unique about our, what the collaboration is that we all got together. I didn't, nobody had to be instructed on the importance of the story. We all just kind of got it, even though we didn't fully understand where it was going to go, but we knew at the, we knew that like we had to try and we also knew that like there was nothing guaranteed. So like, we just had to, we knew there was that, that reunion coming up in, in Florida. And that if we could make that into a successful shooting endeavor, then we could probably have a movie. So we just went and did it. Like there was no, none of those people were expecting us other than the venue, you know, so we kind of just like bum rushed everybody and said, hey, be a part of this. And they did it. So that was pretty much how it started. Right. And I think we we went from Florida and then we were super lucky that everyone had time to talk to us. It was Roman and I's first horror convention. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. <laughs> it was also the first time that this Florida convention had ever happened. It was a new director. It was a new venue. It was all, everything was brand new. And thankfully, I mean, unfortunately, it wasn't super attended. So all the stars had downtime, essentially, to like step away from the table and talk to us. And that's the best. That's we got. (laughs) That's a a document. It worked out really well. (laughs) True. Yeah, because I we've gone to conventions since then, and we've seen how mobbed everybody is. And there's no guarantee that anyone has the time or energy to talk to you afterwards. So, I mean, I convention life itself is very emotionally draining. I've witnessed from watching Mark talk to all those people all day and everyone comes up with uh, like a similar story and how this movie has touched them or helped them out of a very difficult situation. And you kind of realize that we're all connected in that same way. We all kind of gravitate towards these films for some reason or or another, and it was very emotional. Now, Nightmare 2, I feel, um, since coming online and becoming a Nightmare on Elm Street fan, because I was a late bloomer, um, 
I feel like more people now than ever before are really talking positively about it because it really was talked about and for many people as the gay horror film in a negative way. Now it's more more positive. And since you've been working on this film for so long, how have you noticed people talking to Mark or talking about the film differently since you started or mm -hmm. over time? Yeah, that was actually, that's the biggest thing for me is I think that, so we've gotten really accustomed to the popularity of the horror genre right now. But even five years ago when I started this, that wasn't the case. I, when I met Tyler and he just lifted up his sleeve and showed me a tattoo, that was random. Like we that yeah. was, <laughs> now people are showing you their tattoos all the time, and all yeah. the, the fun is gone. Well, in the gay genre, in the gay world, for sure. Like I was a horror fan as a little kid. I loved horror, but you know, in the eighties and and nineties, that was like stereotypically not what you would find. Like I didn't have gay friends that liked horror, so it was still a very straight boys world. Um, so I didn't really have people to share that with me. Well, you know, friend like friends. But when I met Tyler, it was like a bond instantly, even though I didn't really know him, because that wasn't a very typical thing that I would encounter. And so I was really excited to find someone that was like myself. So right. now... In, in filmmaking, like you rarely see other gay people on the crew or anything, or at least yeah. it's not very oh, out and I proud claw my way through the sound world you know like it's I was always getting like jobs where they would want me to decorate the studios I'm like I don't do that and you okay. don't want me to do that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it was interesting so with with Elm Street 2 I've noticed that when we started this it was very easy to just google Elm Street 2 and see all the terrible things people would write but now that's not what you see right away. In fact, I kind of have to dig for it. So there's been an extreme shift in a very small amount of time, definitely due to Mark, because he was so blatant about his 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 pride in this. And like, what are you gonna do? You know, <laughs> there's he. I I do commend him 100% for his bravery because it takes a lot. It's not like he had an army an agent and a whole crew of people that are willing to back him up. He was by himself at a table and, right. and got the conversation going. And I think when Tyler and I joined, the thing about Tyler and I is that we're also a little bit non-traditional and that we have zero fucks. Like you, we, <laughs> we believe in what we, we believe relate in. to that. <laughs> yeah. At, well, that's why when I saw what you guys were doing, I was like, I love this. That's what this whole world needs are like we break the stereotypes and we're going to show you what's wrong <laughs> anyway right. but yeah I, I know what you're saying the, the whole elm street 2 thing has definitely changed because uh, even though the gay rhetoric didn't start right away it, right. It, it started later when the internet really became a thing and then we started sharing these ideas and then it exploded but the hate for it was always there. I remember as a kid, like, you know, we all loved horror movies and talking about horror movies and listening to older brothers who could actually go to the theater and come back and tell us all the stories, the scenes we couldn't see. But they always hated part two. But it was just because they were like, oh, it's the dumb one. Oh, it's not. That one's just dumb. It was a never. It was just that they wanted screaming girls and boobs and stuff, I guess. So. Right. I, I came to the Elm Street series through my older sister, who would babysit me when I was younger. And she was always watching Nightmare on Elm Street. I think I watched the fourth or fifth one first, and then kind of came to the series backwards. And number two was always the one that I skipped over. I think it was because people had said it was not the best, it was dumb, it was whatever. So it really wasn't until the Never Sleep Again documentary came out with that oh, it's the gayest horror movie ever kind of talk that I was like, wait a minute, is this something that I completely skipped over? And I had to go back and rewatch it. I, so I was kind of the same way. When when I first saw um, Nightmare 2, I think it was like seven years old, seven or eight years old, and my neighbor 
had a VHS copy of it. And at that point I had only seen like Dream Warriors and the original um, and West Griffin's Nightmare wasn't out yet. And so I had just seen like a, a couple of them and she's like, well, you know, there's, there's more, there's another one. She showed me part two. And I think I was just so young that the film scared the shit out of me. <laughs> like, to right? me yeah. like to me, Nightmare 2 is the scariest out of all of the films. And it just it just scared the shit out of me. But I was so young that like I didn't pick up on that vibe. And it wasn't really until um probably like 10 years ago. Like DeAndre and I used to be in this forum, uh Nightmare on Elm Street Films dot com. And mm. it was really in that forum like you know, when everyone's like ranking their favorites and stuff like that, two was always like in the top for us, for both of us. And we both like, you know, eventually when Mark became on social media, like we both like loved Mark and his personality, all that stuff. But really in those forums, the things that like they would say, I was always so confused. Like, like really, like, I don't, I don't see that. And then afterwards, when I watched it with like fresh eyes, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And now like the thing that I love so much. Like I love being on Twitter and like having these great conversations on like film Twitter and these like straight guys are commenting on Twitter and they're saying things like, you know, two used to be like the lowest on my list, but now it's like in my top three or my top four. Like it is really scary. And I think that it's having a resurgence because people are craving real horror and and the thing with nightmare is with the expansion of of documentaries like scream queen or never sleep again and and the topic constantly being brought up and people having these very like thought out conversations i think they're just realizing that if if nightmare 2 is the gay one right and it symbolizes that everything that's going on in our country over the past few years and it really stands out as like, hey, like this film represents this. And if that's what a person is going through and if that's what a person's Freddie is, if they're getting bullied for being part of the LGBT community or whatever, I think that that's really why a lot of people now are relating to Nightmare 2 a lot more. And and it's just scary. Like it's just yeah. it's downright, that scene where Freddie is burning the body parts scares the <laughs> shit out of me even at 34 years old like i am still scared <laughs> by that scene um but I, I i i see it like i see the people talking about it and and a lot of it is is from what mark did but a lot of it is what you guys did as well too you know you know, going to these conventions and filming and the social media work spreading the awareness it's just it's it's a positive thing and mm. it deserves all the love and praise and mark deserves all the love and praise that he's been getting and it's just oh my so god great. thank you Thanks. Sorry, I just love I just love you guys. Like I just you guys we love are, you too. No, I I, like I distinctly remember meeting y'all when we were at Horror Hound. It was the week that we it was like the day that we launched our Kickstarter campaign. We were flying out to meet Mark in Indiana to shoot some more. And I see all of you dressed up as the you know, the dream the final warriors. girls of I mean your Dream Warriors outfit was fantastic. I just met Penelope yeah. like two weeks ago, and I'm just like, oh my god, uh, unrelated, but yeah, <laughs> no, I was like, oh my god, I need. I didn't know that this horror convention world existed until this project, and now I feel so connected to it, and I feel like myself when I'm there. I get to be a nerd, and it's not weird. So yeah, it's amazing you. how that works. You know, you just live this life where you're constantly like, I don't know if they're going to like me. Maybe I should talk. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should be quiet. And then you go there and you're like, I really like your shirt. And someone's like, that's great. You want to get together for some breakfast? Like, it's just, (laughs) it's so easy to connect with people there. It's amazing. No joke. Like that's, that's what happens. (laughs) You have the shorthand, you get all the references. Um, Yeah, it's great. I have to, I have to say, um, Tyler's heard this a lot, but this is, this is so this is probably the turning point for me in where when I knew that this movie was really important, like not just in my personal beliefs and loving the film and wanting to stand for gay rights. But when I realized that, like, I live in an urban bubble when it comes to gay society, 
I feel like there, I, we, there's so much that we, Tyler and I living in New York City can take for granted because we can, we're in a safe little bubble. But when I met Mark, when we were meeting to discuss potentially the direction of Scream Queen, I drove to Maryland to visit him. And it was a screening of the Dream Master. Lisa Wilcox was there. Joanne Willette was there. And it was very, very early in the morning. <laughs> we had to rent a car at like 5 a.m. to go meet them to watch that movie at like 10 in the morning. But afterwards, there was a little Q&A. And I walked into the theater late, so I couldn't see what the crowd was like. But when the lights came up, I realized there was a lot of your typical looking horror fans, really like stone cold guys that just, you know, I, I get the style. I'm, but they, there was like, it was just a very cold atmosphere. And then they all lined up to talk to Mark and Lisa. And as soon as each one got to the front of the line, they all started talking about their experiences about being gay and not being able to express it and I had no idea because I'm looking yeah. at these people thinking oh I better be quiet they they'll hate me and it turns out <laughs> they're just in this like defensive armor that I forgot about because I've left that world so long ago and I realized like oh my god that I remember carrying that weight and that armor and it's so exhausting and I look back and I was like I've I need they need this movie you know um it's it's it was a it was eye-opening for me and then that was the first time that i saw people all line up to just pour their hearts out to mark and that was that was a new thing i wasn't expecting that either the posters the signatures it was it was a lot so anyway that's that's how it began right i feel like we both had that feeling during the making of this that this is a movie that we needed when we were younger like, if I had seen this movie when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, figuring out my own stuff, it would have helped a lot. So to to turn back around and give something back to the community, I'm very, very excited for. Yeah. Scream it's kind Queen, of full circle. Yeah. Guys... Scream Queen has been, uh, I remember f first watching it. I mean, I had a small idea of what Mark's, story is like and how the film has impacted people but my reach was really into the horror community and the people that cared for it there but watching the film and understanding everything that he went through I mean because he had been so MIA we had just had no idea and knowing why he went MIA and the things that he dealt with it was very it took me by surprise in this documentary that, I mean, it kind of did and it kind of didn't because Mark, like we've, like you talked about, is very open. He's always very yeah. open, very honest. He's really become an advocate, not just for Nightmare 2, but for the LGBTQ community since I first saw him online. And that's really made a huge difference for him, for the films, for a lot of people. But this film was so raw. It just, it shook me. And just seeing how it's impacted other people in the ways that it has, I mean, and, and your feedback, hearing feedback from people who have watched the film, you know, does it surprise you? I mean, because, you know, the film isn't always well received. And I sometimes wonder if people go into this film thinking that it's going to be like a, just like a making of Nightmare 2, but it's so much more than that. I mean, what, right. what is, how has the response been for you? I mean, I see a lot of positives. Are you surprised? Are you like, what are some of the things that you've heard that that's really kind of stood out to you guys? I, I think definitely after we had spent four years kind of putting this together and editing it nonstop that, we got kind of numb to it. Just Roman and I watching it in my apartment after working all day on it. And we kind of forget how people are going to respond to it. So now that we're going to screenings and meeting the people directly watching it, they all kind of come up to us with the same kind of, ex not exhausted, but like exacerbated look. They're like, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for telling the story because I had no idea. And I thought I knew what I was getting into when I went to see a movie about Nightmare on Elm Street 2. And you gave me so much more than I ever thought I was going to get. So, I mean, I think that is like, I feel like I can breathe easy. Like, <laughs> oh, I did my job. Like people, 
people are getting what they want, but at the same time, they're getting so much more than they didn't know that they needed. Yeah. That's got to be a powerful moment for you guys. Like, that has got to be, like, a, like, like I said earlier, like a full circle moment. It's, it's, I'm not saying this just because you guys are our friends. This documentary is literally the best documentary that I have ever seen. I agree. Like from start, oh start. I agree. And 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 so and Thank we've you. been we've been researching documentaries for the past um like two and a half years to just kind of see how things are formulated and put together. And when I I watched it, like I was just so blown away. And my boyfriend, who like sits on his phone during films and doesn't ever really pay attention, like he sat like with his like hands on his face laying on our bed watching from start to finish and he's like who are these guys he's like like, this is just brilliant (laughs) like and so that's so i'm just being honest like to to anyone if they get a chance to see this documentary it is so powerful and that's gotta feel so powerful for you guys to have these people come up to you and just tell you that this is their reaction to it, that they don't even have a question. They're just thanking you guys. Right. And I think we had a screening at the Castro in San Francisco for Frameline. And it was, it was like a mixed crowd. I mean, it was pretty much all gay just because it's San Francisco during pride week, but you had, you had the horror gays, you had, you know, the straight best friends. And then you had like AIDS survivors and all of them came up and were like, you got it right. You told the story like you moved me. And that I think is definitely people have a certain expectation of what a movie about Nightmare 2 is going to be and that they don't realize how the time at which it came out, the the culture that made this thing happen, like no one is ready for the story. And I feel like that is that is really rewarding that people are connecting to it so deeply. Yay. I, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say about it because I'm still getting used to the whole thing. Like I, I do think that it's a, it's definitely a combination of a lot of different people. It's like Tyler is amazing at his ability to edit a story in a way that is creative and different. Um, so like when I, when I met him and realized that he, he has his own creative vision and I realized that it, it's trustworthy. I just let it go. Like what I would, we obviously had input that we would share constantly, but like, I trust the talent of the people involved. And then our composer, Alex was so good. Oh my God. Like maybe two times I had to be like, Oh, can we change it a little like this? Usually he would just like lay it down. He'd send it to me. I'd lay it down. I'm like, Oh, that's exactly what I wanted. You know? And then we have Joey who's making, who was making graphics and he just was grasping what we want. I mean, the whole thing was, it just came together because there's so many people that asked to be involved with it. Just like I asked Mark and then Tyler was like, Hey, me it, yeah it, yeah it was the right i think it was just the right vortex that was pulling these people together so right and then, now, then we got andy we got cecil i mean people just kind of came out of the woodwork to be like i see what you're doing and i think it's important and i want to be a part of it yeah and so for me being able to well finally give birth to this project and like can you know have eight hours of sleep again now i'm <laughs> able to like I like being able to connect with the people that are seeing it because I guess in some way for me, and this is a more emotional part of it, um, I feel like it's my contribution. I'm not, I'm a little, not awkward. I'm just socially, I'm a little reserved. So having this as a means to reach out to the community has helped me and it, and it's rewarding because I feel like I had something to say, and then I was given a platform to say it, and that is I'm grateful for. So, absolutely, that's amazing. That's amazing, and um, yeah, thank you guys so much. I mean, for reaching out, for you know, sticking with it all these years, and really being dedicated to this documentary. Because, like Paige said, it really is a phenomenal documentary. I don't think I've ever been 
so emotionally compelled and just blown away and speechless as I was watching Scream Queen. I mean, my boyfriend too was like, I had no idea. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. I said, yeah, I know. It just, it just blew, it, it blew my mind and how it was told and the people you had involved. And I mean, just every aspect of it is, it's just phenomenal. Wow. I, I think it's really going to continue to make a huge impact on people of all of all kinds and I can't wait to be able to show people this documentary I have a handful of people that I know <laughs> are going to enjoy it and who are going to um who are who, who are really going to get something out of it and I'm 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 so happy that I was able to make it to that first preview screening up in Cleveland that was so oh, cool that to be a part so of that awesome. We loved Absolutely. that we had us there. That was like the most fun. It was the coolest group of people. We probably weren't as sociable as we could have been because we were so <laughs> nervous. That was oh, my God. Fun. The most terrified I've ever been. Yeah. Having to go, you know, we weren't in the groove yet of having to present, you know, in front of an audience and what we're going to say. And just, you know, we were not fluid yet as a team. So it was very awkward, but having you guys there made such a difference for us. Oh, well, that's, that's wonderful. I was just so happy that I could make it. I would have loved to have made it to more of them, but like, I, I knew you guys were going through a lot. I knew you had a lot on your mind that this was the first time you were showing it. And I, I was just thankful to, to be there and to be able to witness it. So thank you for allowing me to take pictures and stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. But well, you... we we have um, we have our actual premiere coming up in soon, um, and we're gonna have a newly you know it's been special screenings up till now, so mm -hmm. we're gonna have the fully unveiled final revised beautiful sounds amazing version soon. So maybe we can have another party. Oh my gosh, I'm so yes. down for that. Oh wow! I'm so it got down. even better. I was... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of changes that have, I mean, you know, like perfection. Yeah. Little bits. So oh, do you guys so feel like, let me ask you guys from one, from two filmmakers to two filmmakers, do you guys get this feeling where it's never going to be fully perfect for you? Like you watch it and there's always one thing that you want to change or add. Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, we've been watching it now in, what, 10 cities so far? And after every screening, we like, do a cliff notes like, okay, what did you like? What should we change? Um, it's you're constantly tweaking and testing it. And I don't, I feel like a healthy thing to do would be to make peace with yourselves and move on. But I understand the perfectionist side too, of being like, I can make this perfect to suit my standards because no one else cares as much as I do. Right. That's so that's an amazing thing because that's that's um. Like with talking about making changes of that, I'm like, I could just imagine you guys are there like running with like a little Freddy pen and like a notebook. <laughs> like, like, okay, let's take out this or let's let's put this lower third there. Or, you know, I just yeah. imagine that's what you guys are doing. No, I, I think like the most rewarding part of watching it with people is that they laugh when they're supposed to. And like, there's a lot of moments in the editing room where Roman and I would fight about what is working, what is not. And to like hear the things get a laugh that you don't expect are going to get a laugh. It's like, oh, maybe we were onto something we weren't aware of. And then at the same time, in certain screenings, you hear people kind of hiss at the screen. Like they're really invested in Mark's story. And it, it becomes a call and response that I was not aware could happen in a documentary. But people are certainly responding better than I ever thought possible. Oh my God. I mean, I didn't even consider the, the audience factor. You know, I figured, especially when we were editing, you know, we would show things to people and get reactions. And, and even when it was finished, you know, getting feedback is one thing, but sitting in the audience is another, you know, uh, that was very, cause you can't press pause. Number one, Oof. And <laughs> Oof. you can't press pause. And they are telling you what they think just by being there. Um, it's it's very. I mean, you feel naked, but at the same time, it's you. 
then you can feel extremely rewarded. So it's, uh, whoa, it's a lot. But you guys, you guys, how do you feel about this whole thing? Like in terms of being a perfectionist with stuff, are you, are you finding that difficult? Um, (laughs) I, I would say, (laughs) I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to really answer that. I feel like, well, you guys know it's, it, it it takes a long time to make a documentary and I, I've I've never made a documentary before. I've only done film. And so we went into it and I very much had like a structure of what it was like I thought I had an idea of what the story was and two and a half years later I had no idea what the story was and it's completely unfolded differently I mean so yeah like you guys know I'm sure that's I'm sure if that happened to you guys as well too like the story unfolded yes more than what you thought it was was going to be and so I started editing the project um but then I realized that I wanted more. I wanted, mm. I wanted a little bit more content in it. I wanted to follow a few things a little bit more. Um, and then we had some really cool people like reach out to Deandra and Deandra like sent it over to us. And we were like, Oh my God, like, absolutely. So uh, my thing is, is I just want us to be done filming. Like, yeah, no, absolutely. That yeah. will change everything for you. Cause then there, you're like, here's my pieces. Right. There's definitely, I, I equate it to being a final girl. It's like to finish a documentary, you have to be resourceful. You have to take the scraps that are in the pile of heaps that you've been through a hundred times before and try to rework something to get yourself out of a a, a rut. And we definitely had to do that with our own film because I think, you know, up until a year ago, we were still like, oh, we we need to interview more people. We got to like figure out these story threads. And then you kind of have to step back and be like, what is our story about and who needs to hear this and what do we want to say to them? And once we figured out those kind of things, like almost after every meeting with Roman editing, we would sit down and try to like formulate as clearly as possible what our intentions are for this and how we're going to say them. And from that, like make decisions based on those answers. And you kind of like, oh, I have everything I need. I just need to repackage it. Yeah. And a lot of those were really hard decision decisions. We had to, there, there's parts of this movie that I am very sad we had to cut out. And I don't mean like little scenes. I mean like chapters of, of points that we, you know, we, there's a gender issue I really believe is at the heart of, I think both of our documentaries and uh, it just was kind of like derailing the story a little bit, but it definitely is a topic that, you know, I, I dream of adding it as an extra one day if we can. I was just going to ask. <laughs> yeah, it would be, it's, it's a very important thing. Um, it Sometimes, you know, you have to be willing to, to chop stuff out to keep it streamlined because that's the most important, you know, it's bigger than all of us really in the right. end. And I feel like that's a hard thing to do when you're helming your own film. It's like you got to kill your darlings in order to make people really trust that you're capable of finishing it and doing it and making it a, a worthy, interesting film. And if you get them in that point, then you're allowed to show them the other things that you fought for so much that just weren't ready for this film. Like the extras, like all that stuff, you have to build up your fan base before you feed them things that are only for fans. Right. With with that, what do you guys? What is your plan? What's the next step for the film? You're going to have your official premiere, your big launch premiere. Right. Um, and then, are you guys hoping to get distribution? Are you guys hoping to then have like DVDs and Blu-rays where you have all this amazing bonus? Um, content that you guys have like like what, I, what would you guys say your plan is for i that? think all the things you mentioned are excellent ideas and i think we are really gonna try to make that happen mm-hmm. as soon as possible i also know that we have an almost complete full fall schedule where we're in a different city almost every day from end of september through november so 
Awesome. And as we've been on this call, I've already gotten more emails from overseas. So uh, right. I'm, it's, we, we it's are, expanding every day. Yeah. We aren't at liberty to start um, handing out DVDs and Blu-rays until our festival run is done. Right. But I feel like some news might happen soon that everyone will be really excited about. I'm yep. so proud of you guys. Yeah, I'm literally so proud of everything you guys are doing. We were super well, proud of you guys too. And I hope you find your Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want a less vague answer of something <laughs> coming up, we do have a, a soundtrack, a vinyl soundtrack that will be launched in September. Um, and Ooh, go along with our premiere that we're not really allowed to announce yet. But we have vinyl and it's been pressed and it's being packaged and some of them will have Mark Patton signed posters inside. It'll be a pink record and it was produced by our executive producer, Matt, uh, Matt Chonaki, who is amazing. He's the one that made like really made that poster happen. The, the colorful Jesse dancing poster. Oh, that's such a smart poster. I love that poster. The Matt Ryan Tobin um illustration yeah so uh he's been matt's been matt chonaki's been extremely um ah, he's been the backbone of a lot not just the creative stuff like making pulling these people together and making it happen but also like telling us connecting us with interviews and magazines and press and also telling us how to behave and speak so we don't <laughs> go off the rails which right and he would he would be like oh you know you really need to speak to this person over here and that person over there i'm like i would like to but i think that people respond to you better so right. he was always really good at being the liaison between us and making things happen so well, on top of that, also being like our number one cheerleader to like get us oh, totally. to this point. Like he he saw something in that Kickstarter video that was like, oh, I need to help these guys out. And it couldn't have happened without him. So we're very appreciative of him. Totally. It was I think the other thing was just that there were so many times that we're and, you know, you're in the middle of your project, like it's, it's a very heavy weight that you carry every day where you're at right now. And it's hard to dream big when you're in that stage, because you're, you can only focus on everything that you're trying, the problem solving that you have in front of you. So as a filmmaker, you're like, is you don't wake up and start dreaming of a bigger, brighter poster and articles and things like that you start thinking like how am I going to get out of this so that I actually have the movie I want to make so he was always the one that would step up and very gently make things happen without making me feel like I'm going to scream so it was <laughs> really helpful um, and you know I I am excited to find out more about Fred Heads because you guys have been tough stuff from the beginning um, and you haven't always had an easy time so we definitely have a lot of parallels between us. Like, uh, I, I mean, you've come into a genre that's completely sexist in many, many regards. So to be able to stand up tall and be like, we're doing this and you're not stopping us. I mean, that's fucking rad. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, <laughs> I do think that it's cool that like we're humming this documentary and it's helmed by four very strong women. And you don't you don't see that often in in this genre in this world and I do I that's so that's very kind of you so I, I, sure. I think we're 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 excited for what's going to come <laughs> <laughs> yeah can't Good. stop these two trains over here uh uh nope. scream Woo! queen and Fred heads coming full speed for you so, so what do you double uh, features uh, yeah double feature there you go did you. <laughs> You guys have obviously seen I Am Nancy, correct? Uh, yes. Maybe. <laughs> I may or may not maybe, have, maybe I think, four copies. <laughs> okay. Um, well, what did you think of that? Did it, or Paige, you saw it, right? I did. So so I, um, I saw it when it first came out. I ordered one of the DVDs and then Heather sent me one later on so I've got one in a frame and I've got one that like we watched that's free um like free and clear but um I I loved it I feel like 
we we talk a little bit about this in Fred Heads. Like it's it's funny. We just had our final like group filming event where we had like a, a round table where we like talked about everything we've been doing over the past few years. And it really was like Nancy centric. Like it was very heavily Nancy. And so mm-hmm. when I first saw I Am Nancy, it was it was great, but it kind of was like the same feeling that I have a little bit towards like Mark and like Jesse, like, like back then Nancy just was so unappreciated and she's just now getting more appreciated. And even Heather is just now like her lines are just as long as Robert's now. Sometimes her lines are like two hour waits, you know? And so Mm -hmm. at the time, at the time, like I, I really enjoyed the documentary and through the years and our, our friendship with Heather, she's jokingly, like, said, like, I wish that I would have known you guys during the I Am Nancy because this is what would have been I Am Nancy. Yeah. And so for us, like, with making our documentary, like, it it really reflects a lot on that because even though Freddie is, we all love Freddie and Nightmare is so, so big, a lot of us were brought together from the Nancy character. And so we do talk a lot of, about that. And we talk about the importance of I Am Nancy and the importance of Scream Queen and, and really getting those, those stories out there. We, uh, Kim Gunzinger, my uh, co-director, we joke like when looking through some of the footage that like, is this just I Am Nancy too? Like, is that what we're <laughs> like, like, is that what it's going to be? We're going to have to like message Heather and be like, sorry, we're doing I Am Nancy too. But um I think that any documentary in the nightmare world is great because we are part of this super elite club. And I don't like, I joke around about the other fandoms, but I really don't know like the horror, like the, the Halloween fandoms or the Friday the 13th fandoms. I really don't see a lot of like their stuff, like how the nightmare fans, we are just such an elite crowd like we're just we're so active it's very active yeah I mean I've seen a couple of podcasts for Halloween and Friday the 13th but I remember there being a story a couple years ago I think like right after we announced Fred Heads about some Halloween fan documentary or something like that and I mean there's the Friday the 13th game but I feel like uh even though Halloween had the other movie and Friday the 13th has you know, the, the video game. And there is some some official stuff out there. I really feel like A Nightmare on Elm Street is very, very, very much driven by fans, people who started yeah. out as fans. I mean, looking at Tommy, Tommy started out as a fan. He had his book. He has Never Sleep Again that he worked on. You know, Roman and Tyler here, us. I mean, there's there's yeah. so much about it that has really been driven by the fans. And it's, it's, really, it's really amazing what we I can think do. That, I think that the... Like what you said about I am Nancy too <laughs> was essentially kind of I, I honestly think that's a good direction, so to speak. I mean, we watched all the documentaries when we were getting started just to kind of get an, an idea of what we'd want to do or not do creatively. The one thing about hers at first when I saw it, I thought I love seeing her this way because I've never seen Heather Langenkamp that way um and but I you know perhaps her documentary didn't live up to all my expectations but it was a good conversation starter there were some points that I felt she she started and someone else needed to carry the torch with them the the topic of like not so much why aren't there dolls of me but I like the idea of like why is everybody like champion champion the villain and why not the hero of the story that's actually the girl here like why are we not celebrating nancy instead of freddie i do understand that um because i always have and i think and one of the points we make in our film is that doesn't matter i think with the nightmare series in general is that it we are drawn to it because the heroes are so awesome you know it's it was the only horror series that allowed you to have these colorful characters that you could latch on to as a kid whether it's alice with her nunchucks yes king Cade and his little comments or the wizard master i loved him like all these people were what different people could relate to 
and I'm definitely a Terran. I'm beautiful and bad. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. I'm well, I'm very much a Sheila. <laughs> like I'm busy, I wear glasses. I have asthma. Like yeah. mind <laughs> over matter. Mind over matter. Like she's the one I probably would relate to the most. I was sad that Philip didn't make it longer into the movie. He was always my favorite. He was the one with the puppets. He yeah. made the puppets. Yeah. yeah. He was a uh, kid yeah. too. God bless him. Actually, but when I, I first fell in love with Nightmare, my, my favorite uh, initially, I was a big, before I really got into the first one, was uh, Maggie and Alice, because those I watched before I ever watched the first one, and I always thought they were so badass. Every character is so, so great in these films. Wait, who's Maggie? Um, um, she is from Freddy's, Freddy's Dead? Dead. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Catherine. Yeah, yeah. Catherine. Yeah. She's She's the bleach blonde in that one, right? Yeah. Oh no, she yeah. is. Um, that's Tra- that's Tracy. Uh, she's the one with the dark hair. Right. Yeah, Billy Zane's oh, Lisa, sister. Lisa Zane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I loved Lisa Zane. Yeah. She was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that when it came out with 3D glasses. Eh, but it's still fun. <laughs> <laughs> it holds a special place well, in my heart because it was the first yeah. one that I ever saw. It was the oh, first one. Oh, you're what was so the first young. Film I you guys. That. Yeah. <laughs> You know what's so funny is I I have to say this about the young thing with Deandra is mm. it's so funny that she when she tells her story she says you know I was a late bloomer and then she says she was like fourteen and I just think that's so funny that in the horror genre that fourteen <laughs> is a young late to watch it's late bloomer for right. horror films like, it's funny well, you it's like you're not supposed to be watching it at four and five you know <laughs> right right but, but like that yeah. that's the like all these people that I've met at conventions, we all have the same story. We saw these movies too young. It terrified us. And for some reason, we kept coming back because it was almost like a test of bravery or something. Like, can I watch a whole horror movie start to finish and not get scared? Can I not cover my eyes at any certain point? Can I survive the night and you know go to sleep soundly and not have nightmares? For me, that was always like the test and I had I would keep watching scarier and scarier movies to see if I would be okay sure so I, I don't know I, what I don't know what I was thinking but I for some reason decided I was gonna hang a glow a dark hockey mask above my bed and then I'm wonder why I, for punishment. <laughs> yeah so that would be the last thing I see and then wonder why I have crazy scary dreams all night so Gee, i don't know why jason Voorhees is coming to murder me i can't quite figure <laughs> it out <laughs> i don't know i'm stuck up a tree and he's gonna yeah so that that was ridiculous but it was definitely we all have those same kind of things i think you you may have been a late bloomer in regards to the series you know each it, it had already run its course i guess by that point but you were the perfect age for all that Exactly, it's and you were true. still young. You were yeah, still and young. and I guess wow. I got into it right at that right time, right as the internet was coming up. That's when Mark Patton got online. That's mm. when Never Sleep Again came out. I like I I was a late bloomer, but I guess it did it did happen at the right time because now I have all of these wonderful things to to enjoy every day between interacting with everybody on facebook <laughs> to yeah watching you know my four copies of i am nancy to seeing scream queen <laughs> at its at its first you know preview in a theater i mean how awesome is that that you know these films are so uh, i don't want to call them old but they've been around for a while and uh classic these things exactly, are classic exactly and and yet we're still there's still so much to talk about all the time i have i have a question for you guys though because you i think that you know you are very friendly with all of the actors you've been at a lot of shows with them right right yes so uh, they i uh, like you know they've they've done a few events with us and but I haven't, we've been so busy. I don't really get to connect with people. I don't even know who knows me or what, but you guys have made pretty close friends with a lot of them. I mean, what is that like for you? Especially like with Heather, who is sort of the basis of your, of your statement. Um, I mean, is that just like, are you over the moon about it? Is, are you strange. over it? <laughs> it's very strange for, for me, for me, I would say it's, it's very, it's a very, um, 
It's a very strange thing. I I have looked up to a lot of these people, their characters, since I was four years old. And we, we talk about this a lot in our documentary, but um, really, like, a lot of these characters in this film saved my life. And so mm-hmm. I never, in a million years, at the, the, the life that I had, I never in a million years thought that I would grow up and be friends with these people and be able to talk to them and have conversations with them. And, and, and everyone that we've come in contact with is, uh, they're just so genuine, you know, like they're just very sincere and genuine. And, and I, so to me, it's just, it's very weird. It's a, it's a, it's a humbling experience and it is mind numbing. And I always say, if I could go back in time and tell that little kid sitting on a stoop mm. in Chicago who was had the worst life in the world. Like, just hold on. It's gonna be okay. Like I it's, hope it's gonna be I okay. hope you feel it's super empowering too. It should be validating your own the fire that you guys have. I mean, not everybody can just do that. You know, when we started filming for the first time, I was so excited to be able to take Robert England upstairs to sit down for an interview, right? That blew my mind and what 10 minutes turned into an hour you know (laughs) but I never once for a second during that time thought in a few years I'll share the red carpet with him and we'll take photos for the press together like that was just very weird and uh, it's hard to comprehend but I do have to believe that there's there's something that you guys have and there's a there's a fire there that I hope you you understand so keep let that help you when you're having trouble with your edit or fighting with somebody (laughs) or something's not working out just know that you're meant to be doing what you're doing and people need to hear it so well thank you You that's definitely such a positive influence for us cool yeah when i was when i i mean when i was little movies have always been a part of my life i mean my junior what if was what if deandra didn't have obsessions because I've always had them <laughs> since I was a little girl. And to me, they were just like this other world, like somewhere far away that I would never have anything in common with or I'd never meet these people. They were just they were just something else. It was almost it wasn't necessarily like a thing, but it was almost make believe but real. It just was distant. Yeah. And to be able to just talk to people online and eventually have things work out as they did, I mean, I continually have to pinch myself and say you're in a freaking issue of Fangoria with Mark right? Patton like right? that is I mean I collect Fangoria can we get like a round of applause for that <laughs> yeah thank you Fangoria that was pretty amazing Jeez, this is this is insane I mean I would never have imagined this and when I gave a presentation to my work people who are normies and they just loved mm-hmm. the horror world yeah. that I'm involved in it, 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 it was it was astounding because I try to live my life as a couple of different people. The the person that I felt I was supposed to be that my parents wanted me to be and the person that I really was. And that's why I love the horror world so much and connecting with people because these people just, they are like you. They're people that you can connect with so easily. And the person who will always make the biggest impression on me. I mean, I know I have Heather and, and it's like a weird disconnect. It's like, there's Nancy. Like I should look at all my Nancy memorabilia and be like, this is weird. But I look at Nancy and it's like, that's Nancy over here is Heather and Heather is separate from Nancy. That's how I feel anyway. But the person who I always believed made the biggest impact on me from communicating online was definitely Mark Patton. I told all, I tell all of the, all of the nightmare stars when I talk to them, they're like, I want to get more involved. I said, well, look at what Mark Patton is doing. Look at how he's interacting with people. Look at how friendly he is. Look at how much he's advocating for uh, his character and the film and the deeper message and the, just the things that he stands for. Just look at him. And Mark Patton continues to be the example, I feel, in the world of A Nightmare on Elm Street, in the world of horror, and in just many ways, just life in general, about being kind um, to people, to...
finding your voice and and having the courage to to use it and and just to be a friend. I mean, I still watch Nightmare 2 and I'm like, yeah, there's 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 Mark, but it's also, you know, just Jesse. But then I see yeah. Mark and to be able to like before the screening sit there at dinner with him. It was just like, yeah, I'm just chilling out here with Mark. I mean, it it's it's so wild to me. I just don't think my brain has fully grasped it. I just know <laughs> that Mark is a person I just admire so much and I tell people about him all the time because I think he's such an exemplary human being. And oh my um, god. Yeah. That, so uh, one there, crazy cool there's... quote we need for Mark for sure. I think that the one thing that I that I guess where I get a little emotional as is also where so in the eighties, <laughs> not to date myself, but being a kid watching all these movies as they came out, often in the theaters, and then you know being in the schoolyard, like it was not a fun time if you were different i mean it's never no kid no no outsider ever feels like hey this is cool but it was exceptionally rough back then because there were no filters on the way that people treat it like if you watch most 80s movies it's usually like bullies picking on nerds like that's kind they made tons of movies just about that it's like if you tie a sweater around your neck you're totally an asshole and you're gonna be you know it, you know, nothing's changed if you're still tying sweaters around your neck. <laughs> but that was, that was, and like the way that women were per- portrayed was always the same. And I felt like Nightmare on Elm Street was different because they didn't portray women that way. I can't think of any time that they did. Um, or the guys, like they gave you characters that seemed more real. Um, yeah, they were horror. But I remember growing up, I was always asked the question by my family, by just anybody, like, why horror? It's such garbage. Like, it was so just, it was hated in the way that, like, comics were hated decades before. And now, this same genre has, like, it seemed to stand up on both legs. It's grown up taller, and now it's like, you will listen to me, because we've got all these outsiders that now feel a lot better about themselves, and they've got something to say. And it just, it seems like it's a nice, empowering time because it's been reflective of our society, these stories that they're telling. And and it's just, and, and I think that it's so what you're doing and what we were hoping to do was take those little cracks in this this society we have and like try and mend them and be like, you're gay and you like horror and it's okay. And, right. and we can all get along because everybody in this world is sort of an outsider. So we can, we can feel better about ourselves and girls too. Like I was super excited to see so many girls that liked horror when we started going to these conventions. Uh, Cause that was never the case when I was younger. Um, it's just, it's cool. I think it's say. a good thing. I think, that, you know, that is a really great like symbolism for, for the freaks and the geeks and the whatever they used to call us back in the day, you know, um, it's like, why wouldn't we be gravitated towards horror like that? They were the freaks and the geeks of the, the, the film industry. So why yeah. wouldn't we gravitate towards that? Like if that's how we're being treated growing up and we're being bullied and horrible, like we're going to connect so much more to characters like, Jesse Walsh or Nancy Thompson or Alice Johnson or you know we're going to connect to those characters because they're they're going against the grain they're they're in those films people are telling them you're wrong or they're getting their pants pulled down or a snake put around them or you know they're they're getting told no they're getting told no and they're going against that grain anyways and saying listen shut the fuck up and I'm gonna win and if I'm the only thing I have in the end, that's all that matters because I'm enough. And I think it showed <laughs> a lot of us. Like, I think it, I think that's what it is. I think that's why we connect is because it showed a lot of us that we are enough and that we don't have to worry about other people in society. I don't give a shit what anybody thinks about me anymore. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the strength that came from these strong characters that were written for for Nightmare. And it's just, it's so powerful. And I really think that uh, people, um, 
I really feel like with with horror people, everyone's everyone's very similar in the sense, rather just humanity. It's shocking to me every day. I'm learning more and more just how similar and alike we are. People want all want happiness, and whether they want to admit it or not, they want love and they want to be accepted. Um, and I just feel like, you know, we have been kind of shunned, or people always ask why horror. Because it is, it is different, but at the same time, we're not as afraid to be ourselves. Some people will fall into boxes and everywhere that people want them to be, but a lot of people are standing up and they're saying, this is me, and that's really a lesson that's, you know, taken through horror. It is, you know, through these, through these gay horror movies, through these strong male and female characters, through black characters finally surviving everything like that. These these characters right. that aren't so prevalent in everyday life as being the heroes finally are and and we're standing up and we're getting that courage to say this is me. And I think other people look at us and they don't quite understand that strength that we have right now because they're still in their little box, but we've managed to yeah. figure a way out of it. <laughs> I, I have a funny gay nightmare story, actually, that goes along with that. Um, when I was in the seventh grade, um, I was in a split math class. So there was like seventh graders and eighth graders. So, you know, that's never cute. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sitting next to like the biggest toughest eighth grader all year he was like the guy that you know that like he goes home in the living room smells like cigarettes you know that like his his older brother totally like picks him up in a <laughs> in a Camaro and like doesn't have to do his homework like he was like the kind of guy the older kid that like you just watch your step around him right yeah and the the dream child had just come out and I was so excited I made my dad buy me the book so I could read it ahead of time I got the t-shirt from the catalog I got um the magazine there you know they came out with the movie magazine so I went to see it and that's a whole other story but I came back to school. I, ha I carried that magazine every day and I'm looking through it. And the kid next to me, he goes like, hey, let me see that. And he's like, you like this? And I was like, yeah. He's like, hmm. And he gives me a look. And sort of like, a, okay, I guess maybe you're okay. Um, <laughs> and he's looking through it. And he's saying little funny comments. He's like, yeah, I want to see this. I guess I'll go see it. Blah, blah, blah. And then he gets to a picture of Dan, you know, the... Alex, Alice's boyfriend. He's like, oh, he's like the heartthrob, huh? And like, I wasn't really paying attention. I'm like, yeah, totally. <laughs> he, he looks at me and I looked up. I'm like, did I just say that um, out loud? And Major just League looked, hunk. Major League hunk. The way he said it was like he was setting me up because I wasn't really paying attention. And then I'm like, oh, shit, that just came out. And I meant it. And then um, he, the look, I won't forget the look he gave me was just like, I knew it, bitch, you know, like, and he didn't say anything and just gave the magazine back. And he was just like, I'm watching you, you know, <clears throat> Flash that was forward so four years, you guys are dating. No, but fast forward a few years, um, we're in, he's graduating high school and I'm a junior and I signed, uh, he signed my yearbook. And he wrote, when I met you, I fucking hated your guts, but <laughs> I've learned that you're actually a really great guy. And I thank you for opening my eyes to the world around me. And I was like, wow. what the fuck? That's awesome. That's amazing. Right? That's like, so amazing. Oh my God. First of all, like a full circle. Right, the fact that he would even say that is like, okay, that's pretty insightful for a teenager. Uh, but it, it, you know, that was the first time that I actually felt like, cause you don't have, I didn't have to, I felt like, you know, growing up, I always had to be defensive. I had to be on the defense. You have to be careful. You can be who you are, but you always have to have, you know, look over your shoulder. And that was, that was just kind of validating for me that like, maybe it's not always going to be that way. So, right. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Before we wrap things up, I do have a question for everybody on the call. Um, where do you guys think Jesse Walsh ended up? Like, what do you guys think happened to him? Oh, well, see, I've read 
marks Jesse's lost journals story. And that's actually what I did before I wrote to him the first time. And so that is a whole trip in itself. And that is, have you, have you read that? I have. It's like, it's like really mm -hmm. good. I, um, I, that, that's I, kind I, of where I think he went. Okay. All right. All right. Tyler. Oh man. Um, I mean, if they made a proper sequel with him, he would be, you know, the first person killed in the next movie. So I don't, I don't necessarily know if I can divorce my thinking from like genre rules, but I don't know. It would be cool if he was in Dream Warriors. It would have made sense, like lock him up. He just went on a rampage. Right. I mean, like exactly. if they found him, he if he was one of the kids in the room. Like in lockdown because he thinks that he's this serial killer. Yeah. Like that. I have a, I have a that movie even more epic. I have a theory, and I've approached Mark about it. When DeAndre and I made our fan film Shameless Plug, Don't Fall Asleep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in it. Totally uh, like. Uh, yeah, in it, I had this idea to include the character of Jesse. And I wanted to be very respectful of Mark because he was so good to us. And so I reached out to him and I said, hey, I have this idea of where I think Jesse might have gone. And I think it'd be really fun to tie it in this way. And and he's like, well, I'm writing Jesse's lost journals. He's like, so I don't think that's where it would be. So So respectfully, because that's what he was doing, I left it out. But my theory has always been that Jesse was the kid that they talk about in Dream Warriors, where they said we lost a kid a few months back. He cut it off his off. eyelids. I always assumed growing up that that was Jesse. So like I was always like, that's that's got to be Jesse. His parents checked him in. They thought he was crazy. And he just cut off his eyelids. And that's what happened to him, that he went to Fairview instead of Weston Hills. And I was going to write in in our film Nancy, when she's going to her interview with Dr. Sims, you see this kid in a yellow shirt with the black crosses and the mm -hmm. background just blurry. Like, so you couldn't really see him, but you would know that that was like our homage. Like, and he was that kid. That's clever. I love that. I, cause I really feel like that's what happened to Jesse. And then he wrote the Jesse's Lost Journal. So I was like, okay, that's official canon. It comes from Mark. Yeah. <laughs> like, see, well, what do you happened to Jesse? Um, well, you know, I, <laughs> it's, it's a toss up between Jesse's lost journal, but I just love that theory so much that I'm going, I, I kind of really am sold on it from that alone. It's just such a missed opportunity that we never saw more of Jesse, but, uh, with what we have, I, I kind of believe he, he may have gone to Weston Hills cause that seems to be what the parents did at the time but well, especially in, in freddy's revenge they're always talking about like he needs a methadone clinic he needs this he needs, you know like it's all drugs like it was a perfect setup to finally end up in a place like that yeah yeah but yeah. that makes for one h double hockey sticks of a discussion <laughs> so yes. thank you guys so much for coming on to talk about scream queen mark jesse horror and just Everything under the sun. This has been wonderful. It's been worth the wait. Oh, thank you so much. This was amazing. Yes, yeah, so happy to do with, do this. So before before you go, if you could just let us know maybe of some upcoming dates where people might be able to uh, see the documentary at a screening. Sure. Uh, Tyler's good at this. I think officially we can tell you about Sidewalk Festival in Birmingham, Alabama, which is Wednesday, August 21st. Uh, we have a few more things happening after that, but we're not allowed to tell you about them until we get the okay <laughs> from other people. But if you want the most up-to-date information of where we're going and where we're coming to, you should definitely check out ScreamQueenDocumentary.com because we will have all our information up there. Can we tell them territories or no? Um... I, I we don't want you guys taking the top off. <laughs> comfortably, we're we're hitting the south next. Yeah, super bunch of south, and then super. a lot in the east coast. So get ready. <laughs> I'm so excited! I live on the east coast, so I'm super excited for you guys to 
to hit up there because I would love to see this in theaters. It's it's one of the films that like seeing it on a on a television is great, but I can only imagine what it's like to sit in a theater and watch this hey, film. Hey Paige, right. let's uh, go and cosplay as Jesse in the drawer. What do you say? Yes! Oh my God. <laughs> I've been begging people to do that. Oh my God. Can I wish oh. you could do, do that in the past so I can film it and put it in the movie. <laughs> I mean, if you hurry up now, maybe we can get it. <laughs> For sure. Well, thanks so much, no, guys. <laughs> Send me that because it's going to be amazing. Listen, don't put an idea in DeAndre and I's head because we will make it happen. We will do it. It's oh, no, happen. I need this. I need this in like 20 minutes. Can you make it happen? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Let me get my suspenders. Um, <laughs> Thank all right. you very much. It's been amazing. <laughs> so this is DeAndra. And this is Paige. This, this is, is Roman. Ty- <laughs> <laughs> I always went first the last two times. Sorry. Sorry, you're right. <laughs> I feel All like right. you should keep that one in. I'm going to oh, keep I- that one in. <laughs> I feel like that was perfect. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll go with that. All right. Well, anywho, guys, uh, this. <laughs> thanks for listening to Elm Street Radio. Uh, remember, whatever you do, don't. Don't fall asleep. asleep.